But first, the United Nations says the number of refugees fleeing the fighting in Syria has reached one million, with neighboring countries struggling to cope with the flood of refugees. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees is urgently calling for funds to prevent a humanitarian disaster. And the British government says it will step up its aid to Syrian opposition forces by supplying body armor and armored vehicles to, quote, help save lives. Gavin Hill has the story. Driven from their homes to this, the harsh reality of refugee status. A million Syrians have been forced to abandon their country for makeshift camps. Half of them have done so since January this year, and many are children. Tented towns springing up to shelter the influx. They escape with their lives, but with precious few belongings pouring in their thousands into Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey and Egypt, countries which are becoming overwhelmed by the exodus. One can imagine in one of the most sensitive regions in the world what impact the Syrian crisis has. Uh, and if we want to avoid an explosion in the Middle East, uh, if we want to guarantee the peace, the stability in the countries around, it's very important to find a political solution for the Syrian crisis before things get much worse than what they are now. Today, British Foreign Secretary William Hague said the world's efforts to end the bloodshed had been an abject failure, and he announced the UK will offer millions of pounds in what it's calling non-lethal equipment to Syrian opposition forces. Our policy has to move towards more active efforts to prevent the loss of life in Syria, and this means stepping up our support to the opposition and thereby increasing the pressure on the regime to accept a political solution. Meanwhile, the Free Syrian Army says it could bring down the regime in a month if it had the weapons it needs. But not all Syrians fleeing the fighting are ending up in camps like these. Many are unaccounted for. When you're talking about refugees that are um, uh, registered with the UNHCR, uh, it tends to be people who are very poor. It takes a certain amount of effort in order to qualify um, for um, refugee status. However, I'd say that most people who are um, middle class Syrian or um, upper upper class, like either they have uh, enough money in order to settle in surrounding Arab countries. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees is appealing for donor countries to honour their pledges. Of the $1.5 billion promised, only 25% has been received. Fears of a human catastrophe are growing. Without massive support from the international community, it will be impossible to respond to this dramatic uh, humanitarian situation in Syria and around Syria. Lebanon is where most of the refugees end up, the smallest of Syria's neighbours and the country least able to cope with a massive and sudden population imbalance. One in five people in Lebanon is now Syrian. And as the fighting in Syria intensifies, with no diplomatic solution in sight, the plight of Syria's refugees can only worsen. Gavin Hill, Arise News. Emma Beals is an eyewitness who just a week ago went to both the Syrian and Turkish refugee camps. Emma is here with me live in the studio. Good evening and thank you so much for joining me. I want to start off talking about both of your experiences. I know that you went to a refugee camp in Turkey. Just describe the conditions, the people, the mood, the supplies. What did you see? Well, in the Turkish camps, it's quite interesting. The Turkish government are doing an excellent job. They're under a huge amount of pressure. There's over 180,000 refugees registered within Turkey at the moment. And within the camp I went to, it was 12,000 people living in containers. Um, so they had walls, a door, they had a proper bathroom, they had schooling facilities, food, they get a small wage. And most of the people in the camp, despite being in, in reasonably upsetting circumstances, were living on a day-to-day -day basis in, in a reasonably good circumstance. And what you saw in the camp in Syria was completely different. It was a huge contrast, it really was. So on the other side of the border, uh, the camp is being run by a small Turkish NGO who are doing a great job within the circumstances, but they run on donations. There's sort of two meals a day in the camp. There's not proper hygiene facilities. There aren't showers, there aren't bathrooms available. Um, there's people crowded into the tents, sort of 17 in some cases in one tent. 
Um, there's children everywhere. There's a small school just been set up in the last two months. But, but the camp was basically overcrowded. It almost doubled in size since I was there two months ago. And we're seeing some of the pictures right now that you took or the ones that were taken while you yeah. were there. This picture of the, the young men is a protest, actually, that took place while I was there. A large group of men, uh, after Friday prayers, marched on the Turkish border, pleading to be let into the camps that they'd heard about on the other side, where there was just basic services available, which they just don't have inside. I know the UNHCR says that the more funding is needed, mm. that this will turn into a disaster if more funding uh, does not come. I wonder, can you shed some light on the difference in the conditions, the difference in the resources, and, and who should be responsible? Well, within Syria, it's really difficult to find out who is responsible. Uh, because of the security situation, there really just isn't anybody there. There's small NGOs, there's people who are sort of working around the rules, who are just getting inside and trying to make a small amount of difference. But it was just so plain to see in the difference between when I was there two months ago that the, the crisis is getting worse. These people, um, they're coming to the borders, they, there's Scud missiles now, they're scared, they're fleeing their homes, and there really is just nothing there for them, nothing available. Um, it's difficult to sort of know who's responsible for that because um, they're not defined as refugees. They're internally displaced people, and there's about two million of them within Syria at the moment. Yeah, I think the last report that I read was two and a half million, which mm. is a mind-boggling number of people. Huge. I know that you talked to some of the refugees while you were in those camps. Yeah. What do they say to you? What is their mood? Every single one of them just says, where is the international community? Why won't anyone help us? Why is this happening to us? They're just... They're so upset and they all have the same story. They've all had you know, family members killed, they've left their homes, their houses have been destroyed and they don't really see a future. They don't see anyone coming to help them. They don't see an end to the war. They don't really see a way that they're going to find their way out of, of this sort of unfortunate circumstance, which is getting more and more desperate. It is certainly dis disturbing. Emma Beals, thank you for joining us tonight and telling us about your experience. We do appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank you so much.